Scripture reading that David selected for a sermon today is Matthew 5, verse 14 through 16. You are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand, and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others, that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. Thank you, Tom. You may be seated. <clears throat> well, today as we continue our Transforming Truths series, I thought we might pause for just a moment and do just a quick review. I pray that our attention to these simple and yet profound truths has been a blessing to you. So far in our series, we have uh, been reminded of some, first of all, important truths about God. Truths like we are loved by God and we are forgiven by God. We are saved by grace. Last week that God is a God who provides for us. These are amazing realities. These are wonderful truths and I hope they're a blessing to you. But in addition to those kind of truths, we've also been reminded of truths uh, about things that we need to be doing, things that God expects of us, like the fact that we're accountable to God or that we have a purpose or that we don't have to be afraid, or we can overcome temptation, we can be good citizens, we can be thankful, and we're blessed even through submission, by submitting ourselves to God and to those in authority in our lives. So if you've missed any of these or you want to go back and look at them, they're always available on the website uh, for audio or at the YouTube channel for the video. Uh, they're free. We're, we're glad to make CDs of them uh, for anyone. But looking ahead to next Sunday, I thought it would be good for us to be reminded of this important truth. We are the light of the world. It is our privilege, it is also our responsibility to point people toward our Savior and Lord who has risen from the dead. Now you ladies who went to the Horseheads Ladies Day last month were blessed to hear two lessons on this subject by Diana. So... For you today, it may be a bit of a, of, a review, of a review. I can say that, I think. So this week I read the story of a preacher whose curiosity got him in trouble when he was a little boy uh, because he wanted to know, does that light bulb in the refrigerator stay on when you close the door? Now maybe you remember wondering this when you were a child. I remember that. Does it stay on when you close the door? So he decided to experiment a little bit. First thing he tried to do is he put his head kind of in the door and tried to shut the door. As you can imagine that didn't work very well. All he got was kind of a messed up ear from that process. Then he tried another thing. He, he, he got right close to the edge of the door and, and he closed it very slowly, trying to peer in there so he could see at the last second uh, if the light stayed on when he closed it, but he couldn't see anything. Once it got past a certain point, the light was still on, but then the door was closed and he couldn't see. One thing he did learn, though, was because he wore glasses, they fogged up as he got real close there and the cold air and the warm air came together. Then he tried one more thing. He grabbed a hold of the handle and he got his feet fitted firmly on the ground and he tried to open the door really quickly, you know, kind of, kind of surprised the light bulb, maybe, before it had a chance to realize the door had been opened. But every time he did it, it was, it was on. And so, unfortunately, he later learned how dark and lonely the inside of his bedroom was. When his mother discovered her ice cream had all melted, she saw the fingerprints on the refrigerator, she knew what had been happening but in the end, he just concluded that for some unknown reason, the light bulb in the refrigerator was always on. That the butter, the eggs, the milk, they some, for some reason needed the light, and so it was always on, because it was always on whenever he could tell. It seemed odd to him that anyone would put a light in there and then hide it. Why well, have a light if no one can see it? And isn't that really the same question that Jesus asked in our scripture reading for today from Matthew 5 you are the light of the world a city on a hill cannot be hidden neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl instead they put it on its stand and it gives light to everyone in the house 
In the same way, let your light shine before men that they may see your good deeds and praise your Father in heaven. Why have a light if it is to be hidden away? Why have a light if it's to be covered with a bushel basket or a refrigerator door? Why have a light if it's not going to give light to all who are in the house? Today's transforming truth is so basic and yet so central to our lives as Christians. Jesus wants us to know that we are the light of the world. You are the light of the world. And that truth is simple and straightforward, but oftentimes we want to make it complicated. But this truth reminds us of the importance of our mission. And it reminds us of how much confidence that God is putting in us. Because we are God's plan to shine his light in this world. Let's spend a few minutes exploring what it means for us to be the light of the world. First of all, let's begin with the need for the light. I, I don't think I need to convince you that we live in a world of darkness. And that there is a great need for the light of Christ in the world. You know, the Bible's always used these kinds of terms for our experience as humankind, our plight, darkness, and light. Matthew tells us in Matthew 4, 16, when Jesus began his, his ministry, he was fulfilling what was said through the Old Testament prophet Isaiah. The people living in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of the shadow of death, a light has dawned. When Jesus came in the world, he turned on the light, right? Jesus said of himself, I have come into the world as a light so that no one who believes in me should stay in darkness. And when Paul was commissioned by Christ in Acts 26, he tells about it. He said, now get up and stand on your feet. I have appeared to you to appoint you as a servant as a witness of what you've seen of me, what I will show you. I will rescue you from your own people, from the Gentiles. I'm sending you to them to open their eyes and turn them from darkness to light, from the power of Satan to God. Isn't that something? Jesus came to take us from darkness to light. And then later when writing to the Colossian Christians, Paul said, for he has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of the Son He loves in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. See, unfortunately, today even, people who don't have Christ are still living in darkness. And most of them don't even know it. Whether they're living a life of great sin and darkness, that doesn't matter. They're still in the darkness. And even those living very good, moral, upright lives or following some path spiritually that isn't Christ, they're still in the darkness because Jesus is the light. He is the one who brings people out of darkness. You know, sometimes we think our world today is darker than it's ever been. But I'm not sure that that necessarily is true. Ever since sin entered into the world, the world has been a dark place. Satan's been busy throughout history, leading people into darkness. Now certainly today we live in dark times. Much of what is good is called bad, and much of what is bad is called good in our day. But there have been other days like our day when things were as dark as they are today. All I can say is there's always been a need for the light of Christ, and there will always be a need for Christ's light to shine until he returns. So that is the need for light. Let's talk, number two, about the source of light. It's important that we keep in mind that although we are the light of the world, we are not the light of the world, kind of in big capital letters. Jesus is the light of the world. First chapter of John tells us about this. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through Him all things were made. Without Him nothing was made that has been made. In Him was life, and that life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, 
but the darkness has not understood it or overcome it, maybe your translation says. The true light that gives light to every man was coming into the world. Jesus is the light of the world. And he said that of himself in John 8 and verse 12. I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. And then in John 9 and verse 5, while I am in the world, I am the light of the world. So Jesus is the light. While he was in the world, he was the light, but he's not in the world anymore. And so now he shines his light through us. We are the light of the world on his behalf. So it's important for us to keep in mind that we are not the source of the light. Jesus is the source. And that helps us remember that he is the point And he is the power and not us. See, our goal in shining our light and being the light is to not draw attention to ourselves but to draw attention to him. Jesus is the one who matters. He is the source of light and power and salvation. Also, it helps us to keep in mind he's the source because then we remember that we have to stay plugged in to the source. See, the second we're unplugged from the source, we can't shine anymore because we don't have the power in us. The power is in him. We must remain connected to him. You know, I think the relationship with, uh, between the sun and the moon um, is one that uh, is an excellent illustration for our relationship with Jesus. Jesus is the sun, and we are the moon. And I'm not sure where those other letters came up. Do you see them? Okay, maybe you don't see them. I'm, I'm seeing some letters on mine. That's good that you don't see them. Anyhow. Jesus is the sun, and we are the moon, right? The sun has the power. It is the light. The moon has no power of its own. It has no light of its own. It simply reflects the light of its source, the sun. And if the moon isn't in the right position with relation to the sun, it can't do its job. And the same thing is true with us in our relationship with Christ. If we're not in the right relationship with him, we cannot reflect his light to the world. Think about this. When the moon cannot reflect the light of the sun, what has happened to the relationship of the moon? Got this beautiful technical scientific picture up here, right? It's called a lunar eclipse. You see where the moon is? And the sun, what's in between? The earth. If we let the world get between us and Jesus, too much world, we can't shine the light. I think it's a great illustration. Number three, let's talk about the plan for us to be the light. Let's turn our attention back to that passage that we read as a scripture reading. Jesus said, you are the light of the world. A city on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand, and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before men that they may see your good deeds and praise your Father in heaven. Now, Jesus uses two illustrations in this passage. And the people in Jesus' day would have understood those illustrations perfectly. Had Jesus been here today talking to us about the subject, he probably would have chosen maybe more modern illustrations. But I think they still work for us. The first illustration he used is the city on a hill. He says it cannot be hidden. Now, in those days, many homes were built from a limestone, a white kind of sandstone. Um, and when the sun hit it, it reflected it brightly. So if you had this city on a hill and these houses made basically of white stone, you could see that city from a long ways away on a sunny day. Perhaps Jesus, if he were talking to us today, would say that a city cannot be hidden at night because we have lights in our cities, right? And, and those lights shine during the night, and you can see it from a far uh, off way. I love to come north on 81 from, from Binghamton to Syracuse at night. 
there's a certain point just outside the city when, when you're kind of on a high hill and the city of Syracuse lays before you in the valley and all you see are these beautiful lights. It's, it's, it's quite a nice place to drive at night. But Jesus is saying that same idea. A city on the hill cannot be hidden. A city at night cannot be hidden either. A second illustration he used had to do with the lighting of a lamp. Now, Palestinian homes of that day were generally dark. Remember, they had no electricity. Couldn't just flip on the switch and have lights in the house. Most of their homes didn't have a lot of windows either. They didn't have nice glass to enclose their windows. So many of the houses would have one small window. Not much light would come in, even during the day. So they lit their homes by lamps. And not nice lamps like we have, but kind of crude and simple lamps, like the one you see in this picture. Just basically a bowl, a pottery, to hold the oil and some kind of wick to, uh, to, to, to burn that oil off. And so when the lamp was lit, it was put in the center of the room on a table or a special lamp stand. Now, when Jesus mentioned the idea of someone lighting a lamp and then putting a bowl over it, the people understood exactly what he meant. If you want the house to be lit, you don't put a bowl over your lamp. But people did put a bowl over their lamp. If they had to leave the house for just a minute or two, they would put a bowl over the lamp. And they did that so that they wouldn't waste the oil. They put the bowl over, and the lamp began to just kind of smolder. Basically, until the, you know, as it used up what little oxygen it had left, and then they come back in the house and they take the bowl off, and the the flame would would brighten right back up. We we'll say, why'd they do that? They didn't have matches. They didn't have nice butane lighters, and so you don't want to blow the lamp out every minute you leave the house because it's not easy to light it again. But neither do you want to waste oil because it was a valuable commodity. So, no one lights a lamp and puts it under a bowl if they want the lamp to light the room. So what's Jesus' point in all this? His point is our light isn't meant to be hidden. As disciples of Jesus, we are to reflect the light of Christ, to let it shine for all to see. We're not supposed to hide our light like a city in a valley. We're to be a city on the hill. We're not to hide our light like putting it under a bowl. We're to take the bowl off and put it on its stand in the middle of the house. And so Jesus concluded, in the same way, let your light shine before men that they may see your good deeds. Praise your Father in heaven. I think the Apostle Paul said it really well when he wrote to the Philippians, and he said, Therefore, my dear friends, as you've always obeyed, not only in my presence, but now much more in my absence, Continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who works in you to will and to act according to his good purpose. And then here's the point. Do everything without complaining or arguing so that you may become blameless and pure children of God without fault in a crooked and depraved generation, in a dark world, right, in which you shine like stars in the universe as you hold out the word of God. Life. This is our calling. This is our mission. To shine brightly against the dark backdrop of our world so that people will hear the word of life from us. So how can we put this transforming truth into practice? How do we let our light shine so we can be the light of the world? Think, first of all, the functions of light for just a minute, right? Right? Some of the functions of light. First of all, light functions to dispel the darkness. As we said, the world is dark. It needs the light, right? Light has great power. Light dispels the darkness. It overcomes it. It cuts right through it. Even the smallest of lights. If you light even a single candle in a very dark place, it's amazing how much light comes from that one single candle light source or think about a cloudy day i love this right where you have this these these heavy clouds in one little opening and and come coming rushing through that opening is the brightest rays of the sun light dispels the darkness 
Or think about a very clear night and how bright it can be outside when it's a full moon. You look out there and there's, there's, there's shadows. The moon is shining so brightly that there's shadows just like during the day. It's, it's truly amazing. God wants us to see ourselves as the light of the world everywhere we go, every minute. And that our mere presence by our Christian life is to shine the light of Christ and to dispel the darkness. Our testimony and our teaching also becomes a source of, of the bright light that God wants us to shine. And so the light of our lives and the light of our words can go hand in hand. And, and even if we're the only Christian in that dark setting, the only Christian at school, or the only Christian at work, or the only Christian in our family, God can shine the light through us to dispel the darkness. Second, though, light functions to give guidance and to lead to safely. Think about the function of the lighthouse on the dark and stormy night. I think that's a, a vivid illustration of the way we're to shine our light in the world. Those ships traveling on those dark nights or, or stormy nights, they, they, they need that lighthouse to, to guide them safely to their destination or to avoid certain disasters. Think about the runway lights at the airport. I, I love to fly at night. I love to see the cities from a distance and things like that. But I like to be able to see when we're near the airport and you see how all those lights line right up to direct the pilots safely in. Jesus Christ is the light and the life of men. And because we know Jesus and we know his teachings, we are the light to the world to lead people safely to salvation. And then third, light functions to attract. Right? Think about the moths, how they're attracted to the light. I love some of the, the comical movies that, uh, that have been made for kids, you know, where the, I can't help it, you know, it's just drawing me in. That's the way the light is supposed to function as Christians, to draw people to Christ. God's created within us humans a, a nature that seeks truth, attempts to fill that God-shaped hole in each one of us. And an attractive life in Christ can be so compelling. Uh, Paul instructed Titus to teach slaves to, to live such good Christian lives that they could be a light, right? He said it this way, teach slaves to be, uh, so they can be fully trusted in every way that they will make the teaching about God our Savior attractive. How we work and serve and live can make the teaching even more and more attractive. I heard about a missionary in India who had a man come up to him one day and say, what do you put on your face to make it shine? And he said, I, uh, I don't put anything on my face to make it shine. And, and the man got a little irritated with him. Yes, you do. All you Christians put something on your face and you make it shine. And then he realized, he said, oh, no, no, no. He said, it's not something we put on the outside. It's something that we put on the inside. And it shines from us. It's Christ in our hearts. And he shines through us. I thought that's awesome. We're all very familiar with the events of 9-11-2000 um, when the terrorist attacks in New York City took down the towers. There was another tragedy just four days later that none of us heard very much about, and, and for good reason. It paled in comparison with the number of lives lost and, and the, the whole situation there at 9-11. But on September 15th of 2001, uh, there was an accident that occurred where... Uh, a large tugboat carrying heavy metals rammed into the supports of this bridge that, uh, that is down there at South Padre Island. And it happened at 2.30 in the morning. It was dark. There were a number of cars that drove right off because three 80-foot spans of that bridge collapsed into the river. And uh, so those cars just went flying right off the edge of that bridge. But somebody said, eight people died, three were injured. If only it had happened during the day when the sunlight could have shown the danger. 
or if we had just had a big spotlight that we could shine on it immediately, or there were some kind of warning lights that could have been tripped, and lives could have been saved. And I thought about what a great illustration that is of, of the world we live in, right? There is this darkness. And today people are driving right off the broken bridge into the abyss below. But we do have the light, right? We can shine it. We are the light. We can shine warning lights. We can alert them to the problem. We can guide them to the solution. How can we do that? Let me just suggest to you quickly. We can keep ourselves strong in the Lord. That keeps us plugged in to the source. That keeps us shining Christ more purely because of his reflection, right? Number two, we can live an exemplary life. People can see our good deeds. We can keep the world from getting between us and Christ. Number three, we can prepare to answer people's questions. We can know the word and uh, be prepared, like Peter said, in 1 Peter 3 and 15, to uh, be prepared to answer everyone who asks you the reason for the hope that you have, right? Number four, we can invite others to come and see Christ in us and in the church family as a whole. And next Sunday is Easter Sunday, and it's a perfect opportunity. Many people will be looking for a place to worship because they don't have a regular place to worship. Why not invite them to come and to see Christ and to see Christ in us? Number five, we can pray for opportunities to share our faith. That's something Paul often asks for prayers for. And then after praying, we can take advantage of every opportunity that God gives us. And I love Paul's prayer there in Colossians. He says, devote yourselves to prayer. Pray for us that God will open a door. And then he says, uh, pray that I'll proclaim the truth clearly. And then he tells the Colossians, be wise in the way you act towards outsiders. Make the most of every opportunity. He says, let your conversation be full of grace, seasoned with salt, so that you'll know how to answer everyone. We need to keep in mind that we have to be wise in the way that we shine the light. You know, it's one of the mistakes kids make. What, what happens the second you give a child a flashlight? What do they do? <laughs> they, they shine it in their own face, but more likely they shine it in your face, Right? We can blind people with the light. And that's not what we're called to do. We're, we're to be the light of the world, but not to blind people, but to help them, to show them the right way, to lead them to the Lord. And finally, we can ready ourselves for those who will receive the good news and for those who will reject it. Jesus said this in John 3, 19. This is the verdict. Light has come into the world, but men love darkness instead of light because their deeds were evil. Not everyone's going to be pleased that we are the light of the world and that Jesus is the light of the world. Not everyone's going to be pleased when we try to point them to the light or shine our light for them to see. We need to be ready for that. My prayer for us is that we'll allow God to help us to be what we are. And that is, we are the light of the world. So let your light shine, that all men will see you. And praise your heavenly Father. So I hope this is an encouraging truth for each of us to keep in mind. We are the light of the world. And that is a privilege, and it's a responsibility.